Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us in our talk, Threat Intelligence Without Context is Just Noise. My name is Vicente Diaz. I am Threat Intelligence Strategist at Virus.Total. And what we want to do today in our session is to discuss some ideas of how we can make a better uh, threat intelligence strategy, how to build it solidly in our company and to provide the desired results. Uh, basically, in Virusotal, we have like uh, the experience of many customers working with us and we've learned what can be like the most effective strategies that can be applied when talking about threat intelligence. And at the same time, uh, we see some mistakes that, well, with experience, we have learned how they can be avoided. So the idea of this talk is to go through these um, ideas. Uh, see how we can avoid some of these typical mistakes and how we can like, you know, find the key elements to make that our threat intelligence strategy will be a success. Um, before going on, yeah, saying a couple of words about threat intelligence. Basically, there is, you know, this uh, very uh, widely adopted word in all marketing materials for every single company. Um, but basically, this is the same, uh, let's say, discipline that has been applied by humankind for the last <laughs> the centuries. Um, basically, now we are just trying to make sense of everything related to cyber attacks. Um, so keeping that in mind, uh, what we really need here is to define what are our expected results, uh, what are our expected goals, uh, what we want to achieve with threat intelligence. Uh, again, this discipline by itself is giving us nothing. It's just something that we can adopt in order to achieve some goals. Uh, remember something that is maybe obvious, but sometimes we struggle to understand is that you cannot buy intelligence. And especially you cannot buy intelligence by weight, uh, which is something that happens very often. Uh, intelligence is just produced as a result of all this digestion of data. And depending what are your goals, you will take one or a different decision based in the best knowledge that you have at this point. So that's why you are incorporating all these different ideas, you are incorporating all this data you are using all these different tools, frameworks, etc., to take the right decisions in terms of security. Uh, and that's why, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, this is nothing you can go simply and buy. It's something that you need to build by yourself. So you need to put a little bit of effort if you want to get like a winning strategy and to really get some results. Um, regarding the data, uh, we said that this is something that you're going to buy by weight, but also very often we see how many vendors and also the, the customers themselves, they want to get that many terabytes, petabytes of data. And sometimes this is not relevant. And what is worse, sometimes this can simply be noise. Unless this data is relevant for us, this is simply uh, getting more space uh, storage and getting more uh, processing capabilities, basically it's noise, and this noise is really uh, expensive to process. So this is something we will be seeing later uh, in a bit more of detail, but we need to be picky with the data we are analyzing. And again, uh, this is something related to what are your goals, what kind of data is relevant for you. So again, depends on the kind of company and the kind of investigation you are doing, depends on your goals. So we know that if we go on to drive successful investigations, we need some methodology. So the same applies to our threat intel strategy. And these days, uh, there are many techniques and there are many new tools and there are uh, different things that we can use to make this really effective. And this is something that we will also be explaining during this presentation because times, uh, well, uh, things change with the time and basically there are more tools, there are more uh, capabilities available in the market and uh, we should be able to leverage them uh, and, and include them in our threat intel strategy for sure. Um, so we will see some of them applied some to some real use cases. So in this presentation we will be very simplistic in terms of uh, different popular use cases. 
Um, of course, that intelligence can be applied to absolutely everything, but I think these are pretty representative. So the different examples we will be providing are more or less related to this. Uh, one of the most popular use cases is prioritizing alerts. Uh, basically, we are just float with alerts and we have all these socks analysts uh, trying to understand what is relevant and what is not, right? So, well, uh, trying to understand what is relevant and what is not is not a simple uh, thing. We need like, to have a proper data, but we need to understand again what is for us more relevant. The same with incident response and forensic analysis here. We start with a very partial vision of something. Uh, we want to, as quick as possible, understand everything that is related to this attack. So we can continue the investigation, we can find more artifacts, we can understand how bad it is and how we need to react. And in terms of APT investigations or research, well, this is a more generic idea of where you have more time and you need to uh, deep, uh, digger, uh, digger deep, sorry, deeper, <laughs> dig deeper in order to understand what happened and, and what is behind this attack and if this is related to some particular actor, etc. So in all these cases, what we need is to have a context. Context is king. Um, we need to have as much as possible in order to succeed in all these different use cases. So with this idea in mind, let's go to one of the main problems, which is the security alert fatigue. Um, basically, how to prioritize all these events, how we can make uh, sure that we are paying attention to the relevant ones, and how we discard all this noise. So here we will see some typical things, some typical mistakes or things that we need to take into account to be sure that we are um, using threat intelligence properly in order to accomplish this goal. The first thing to consider uh, is the problem when we have simple characterization. Uh, what does it mean? It means that basically when we are uh, getting an alert and we have some indicator of compromise, this could be a domain, uh, maybe some sample, uh, whatever it is, sometimes we take a very simplistic decision based in only one criteria. Uh, one typical criteria is is the antivirus saying this is malicious or not. And this is a problem uh, because here in this chart, for instance, uh, that we can see here is how this can change dynamically uh, with time. And some, some attacks we know from the very beginning, they are not detected. And then at some point, uh, antivirus are, uh, are able to pay attention and to understand that there is something suspicious going on there but also the, the other way around, maybe something is a false positive is maybe less popular. So what, can, what else can we use? And actually these days there is a lot of OSINT. We can find references if some of these artifacts have been found in some other attacks, uh, but we can also use things like yard rules. We can use uh, IDS rules, like could be Suricata. Uh, we have some boxes that are also providing detections. We have Sigma rules. Um, so there is a lot of uh, knowledge that we can apply. Um, it depends on how much of this is available to us. But when building our security strategy, a threat intelligence strategy, sorry, we need to take into account how much of this we need. Obviously, we are not saying that every single year rule is valid and, and is like trustable but we should be able to make a selection of sources and to take the decision based in multiple criteria, not just something like good or bad, depending on number of antivirus that they are saying, this is something suspicious. So we need this multi-angular characterization and then decide which, uh, let's say, criteria, combined criteria is the, the one that is working for us. Uh, second thing to take into account is the context, uh, the local context that we have, because we have local visibility in our company, in our network, uh, when we see something happening. And this is only a very partial vision, partial visibility. And of course, everybody has only partial visibility of one attack, but that's why we need to complement it with um, as much visibility as it's available for us 
outside of our company. First of all, we need to consider that our visibility inside of our company will never be perfect. Um, hopefully, well, you have all the elements in place to log absolutely everything and to have all this data available uh, in your CM, for instance, to go and to make all these relationships and to find anything suspicious uh, as fast as possible, hopefully. But it's, it's, it's likely that, well, maybe you don't have this perfect environment. Probably nobody does. But at the same time, you can leverage other people who already went through something similar or the very same attack. Because we know that the attackers are more or less repeating themselves. They are not necessarily always the same, but they are teams who are used to do things in a very similar way. And even with APT attacks, we can see this all the time. The operators keep using the same tool sets and doing the same things. Yes, because they know that they are effective, right? So if we can leverage like others' vision, others' experience and definition of an attack, and check if this is happening inside of our organization, this will quickly uh, accelerate any investigation we need to do and also to get this uh, more complex context to understand how the attacks uh, evolve and what we need to pay attention. Um, another very interesting point is about monitoring whatever is relevant for us and make sure that we have this life enrichment uh, coming our way. For instance, we were mentioning before about your rules, right? Well, um, this along with CMR rules, for instance, is very interesting because can help us like to characterize some types of malware that we want to keep an eye on. Uh, for instance, some ransomware or some particular actor that we are afraid that can be uh, interested in our company. So we want to actively monitor any activity from these attackers or whatever is something that uh, we are worried about. And this is extremely important because the same way that we are like selecting the sources of data, we need also to keep an eye on what different adversaries are doing and how they are moving and how they are evolving. Just to make sure that we are um, inside of what is reasonable as prepared as possible to uh, stop this kind of attacks. So this active monitoring using, it could be crowdsource, uh, there are rules for instance, but you can create your own or your own searches. This is very a very powerful tool. And when we talk about preemptive uh, defenses, uh, this is probably one of the most uh, powerful things that we can do. So this is highly recommended. Uh, to characterize what is relevant for you as a company and then to start actively monitoring it. We should understand that campaigns, that they do not end the day that the IOCs are published. Let's say that today some company is publishing some new attack and they are uh, publishing the different indicators of compromise that they found. It doesn't mean that the campaign is over. It doesn't mean that the attackers will stop doing that. In some cases, it could be that this is the end of this operation in particular, but the campaigns usually they are still alive and the attackers keep evolving and they keep providing uh, or creating new tools and evolving their TTPs. So we should not stop just uh, at the point where we incorporate some IOCs inside of our uh, systems thinking that, well, we are now safe from this attack. We should actively monitor how this is evolving. And maybe uh, the original uh, publication by the team, the researchers that did it, they do not keep uh, publishing more IOCs or they do not keep following this campaign in particular. It doesn't mean the campaign is over. That's why we need to actively monitor and we need to be on top of any campaign that we want to, uh, that is relevant for us just to make sure that we keep receiving all the new IOCs or anything that is interesting for us. Now, uh, another use case is incident response, which is, again, um, something incredibly popular where we need to understand how complex is an attack and how dangerous it is only with partial information. And also, we need to do this as soon as possible, usually. Usually, when we are doing some incident responses because things are hot. So 
First, because we need to get as much information as possible from the victim before it gets called and it disappears. But also because well, maybe the attackers are still active. So we need to understand um, how we respond to them. Um, so let's see a few things we need to take into consideration in terms of incident response. The first thing uh, is, once again, talking about the context. We do not want to blindly use data without the context. Uh, let me put an example. Many times we receive the IOCs. The IOCs by themselves is the minimum, let's say, amount of information that it can be shared regarding some kind of attack. Like, yeah, we found this hash or we found this domain or this IP. This usually, well, of course, this is valuable, but when did it happen? And how did it happen? And what did it happen? This is not something we see in the IOCs themselves. And that's why we need the context before taking a decision. Let's say we simply put a bunch of domains, IPs, um, to detect something malicious, which is what we are doing many times. Um, this has uh, a value that is relative because first of all, uh, at some point this expires. These domains, IPs, whatever, uh, they are not valid anymore. Uh, it doesn't mean they are malicious forever. But also depends on your goal, because if you want to do live monitoring, this is one thing. If you want to keep them for forensic analysis, this is a different thing. And this is one simple example I just found when I was creating these slides. Uh, this is related to some Ocean Lotus attack, and it's relatively recent. It's like from last year. And we can see this domain here is listed as malicious. This is from a popular uh, exchange uh, website, in threat intelligence website. So you can basically, you go there and you find, yes, this is malicious. You can see this is still active. This is pretty recent. This is from Ocean Lotus. So you will deploy it, right? But it turns out if you go to the source of this information, all these websites were compromised. So they are legitimate websites that were compromised. Now, does it mean we need to block this? Well, first of all, they are not compromised at this moment. So right now they are not malicious. Probably you don't want to block them in, in, in your systems, uh, in some live monitoring. But if you want to do some forensic analysis, you need to put the time frame. This was something that was serving some malicious content. Otherwise, it will lead to a lot of false positives. Now, just think about these kind of things, uh, uh, these kind of examples. But if you are getting like, I don't know, uh, one gigabyte per day of this without the proper information, uh, this can lead to a tons of uh, messages, false positives, and it will be a nightmare to, to go through all of this. So that's why it's important to properly clean the data and to properly have all the context. And if you don't have it, well, it's, it's use is relative. You need to consider how you want to use it. Second thing to take into account is that IOCs value is also relative because many times the IOCs, they are unique per victim. Uh, it, it is not always the case, but obviously these days is something that the attackers know and sometimes they are simply changing. Uh, per victim if they have the resources. So the value of the IOCs is also relative sometimes. But nevertheless, there are many things we can do with them. For instance, if we have the hashes, we can use similarity. I mean, if you, we have the samples, we can, well, even the hashes, we can find similarity. Uh, we can use similarity in order to find how they are related to something else. So. Let's say we have the samples, but we, the, we cannot find any reference. But at some point, we are able to find the cluster they belong, the family, the actor, the attacker, the campaign. Then we have a lot of information. We can simply jump from here and to find more elements and keep pivoting until we have the whole picture. So that's why similarity is one of the most powerful tools that we can use these days. And happily, we have many different ways to leverage similarity. Uh, there are like different kinds. One is a structural similarity. Basically, you are finding what is the structure of the malware and you are trying to find if there is something similar. Uh, you can also use behavioral similarity. Like, is it 
um, executing, like something we have already seen. If this is the case, what else is similar to this? Uh, we can also even use uh, visual similarity, uh, which is also very interesting, especially for PDF or like documents that are being distributed in early stages of the attack uh, through a spear phishing, like attachments and things like this, because usually they are, well, depending on the campaign, but in many campaigns, they are exactly the same. They look like the same, like this image we have here, like asking you to enable macro, macros or things like that. So uh, similarity is one of the most powerful tools that we can use, uh, we should. And actually, this is something that we can even uh, automate. Now, uh, let's spend just the last part of the presentation to say a few words about TTPs. Um, TTPs are the mixed uh, tactics and procedures. And basically, this is to solve the problem we were discussing because IOCs can be unique per victim, so are easily replaceable. But TTPs are a bit more difficult, yes, because uh, attackers they use the same tool set most of the time because they don't have that many well they can use like different ones but most of the time they will be feeling comfortable and they will have the whole infrastructure and everything prepared for a particular tool set and also the operators they will be used to work with different in a, in a uh, particular way um, so everybody's sharing these TTPs these days but how to use them is a different story what can we do with them? Uh, just having this collection or, okay, this attacker is doing this and that, or is there something more actionable we can do with them? So first, uh, there are a few things we need to consider. First, that sometimes the TTPs are too generic. If this is the case, then it's not so valuable for us because basically it's too abstract. Like they, they are using a spear phishing, they are exfiltrating data, uh, compressed data, and they are using, I don't know, encryption. It's not saying too much. Uh, second is that the activity evolves with time for different attackers. Still, we tend to put attackers, uh, TTPs in the attack matrix in a static way, meaning that we keep adding more uh, TTPs with time, but maybe this is something that they were using like five years ago and they are not using anymore. That's why it's interesting to have like a uh, refresh, um, let's say time frame uh, matrix, depending how they are evolving with time. And also in many TTPs, uh, there is not a distinction of uh, this is something the attackers are doing manually or they are doing automatically through the malware that they are installing, which is a bit confusing. This is not really helping a lot because it will help to know where we need to go and, and find this data. Actually, there, there is a lot of, uh, there's a lack of criteria in many of these TTPs, how uh, we use them. Still, there is interesting stuff. Um, in some of these TTPs, sometimes we find uh, technical details that actually could be distributed as IOCs, but this is not so popular. We are so used to all these hashes, domains, IPs, that sometimes there is all our interesting stuff that we are not uh, sharing so easily. Or even if we are sharing, our tools are not automatically ingesting this. Um, well, this can be normal, but security analysts, they should be able to find the value of this and they should be taking a look into that. For instance, the serial numbers for the, some signatures that the malware is using. This is something that usually is valuable. Uh, we can use, for instance, to create some YAR rules to monitor. Um, but sometimes this is hidden inside of these TTPs in the technical details and it's not uh, openly share, uh, shared like in the IOCs. So we should always be uh, taking a look into that. Uh, in some cases, we find some details like, uh, let's say, some registry keys that can be interesting, uh, can be useful. But again, if we keep in mind how these TTPs are generated, most of the time this is done in a pretty automatic way. Maybe how they are detonated in the, in the sandbox is automatically detected, hey, this is that TTP, and they simply it's simply created with this registry value, like it's writing something in the registry, and this is one TTP itself. 
Does it mean that the registry entry is interesting for us? Not necessarily. Maybe the registry entry itself is not unique at all, but it could be. So here is the trick. How we can make sure that this information is valuable or not? The only way uh, is to have like a database large enough where we can basically understand how prevalent is uh, this technical detail in particular. Uh, here there are like two examples. The first, both of them are provided as TTPs in different actors. In one of the cases, this will lead to 20 million results, in this case in Barusoda database. In the second one, uh, if we like polish a little bit the search, we will find this is pretty good to find some sofa C samples, APT28. So here is a trick. If you have the database you can use to, to check all these TTPs, you can find something that is really relevant, but you need to understand how prevalent it is. So just to uh, summarize a little bit some of the ideas that we were discussing in this talk, uh, for me, the most, let's say, key idea is that threading the data without context is noise. And I, I hope the way we, we went through different points here is helping everybody to understand why, because uh, unless you have all this context, providing you with the details, uh, we have seen with atomic IOCs, uh, without details, how they are obtained, what was happening, when, how, etc. Basically, they are saying nothing. And th if we get this in a astronomical level, as we usually get these IOCs, then it's a lot of noise and basically it's making our teams to go crazy, uh, our alarms to be firing everywhere, when in reality there is nothing that relevant happening. Maybe it's a false positive. Uh, you can buy intelligence. It depends on your goals. Again, uh, threat intelligence, you need to develop yourself and you need to understand what you need and what you want. And you need to put yourself to work here. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it's something that you need to develop by yourself. Uh, that's why you need to define this clear methodology based on your needs. Be picky with the data, be picky with the sources, and be active, uh, keep monitoring, keep selecting the data and understanding how attackers are evolving, how campaigns are evolving as well. Use all these techniques uh, that we have been discussing. Things like, again, this monitoring or using similarity, using Yara, this should be absolutely something that everybody should be uh, adding to the threat intel strategies and all the analysts should be using that uh, in a daily basis. This should not be like a surprise, but just be aware that all of this exists to make your life easier. Uh, doing threat hunting these days is very different how it was 10 years ago, where you really need to have a very complex infrastructure and many tools and a, a lot of experts. Now, there are tools that are doing this job for you and just use them. Um, be active in selecting the data that is relevant for you. We discussed this, this monitoring, active monitoring is one of the most powerful tools. I use this cross-source with some and telemetry. Again, this is really important. All this data is there for you, so just use it. Uh, this will provide you a lot of context and you can always disagree and just select the one that is more relevant. You can discard the ones that you don't like or the ones that are not trustable for you but use it because it's there to make your life easier and providing you with context. So this is the most effective way. You use all this crowdsourced data that is there for you because fighting all together is how we can uh, actually make everyone's life easier. So this is all from, uh, from me today. I hope you find it useful. Um, Basically, again, the idea is, yes, be clear with what you want, use everything that you have available for you, and use it in a wise way to make your threat intel strategy be a success. Um, so that's all from my side. Happy hunting, everyone.